Welcome, everyone. So pleased you're able to join us today for what I promise will be a fascinating and dynamic discussion. A few housekeeping matters before we get started. We're going to reserve time at the end of the presentation for questions. So please use the Q&A feature. And I noticed there are already two questions on there. And the first question is, do we list our bar number for CLE credit? You do not have to do that if you put your bar number on your registration. If not, then please email me with your bar number so we can make sure you get credit. Secondly, in order to be consistent with Utah Supreme Court rules, we don't give CLE credit to people that register, we give it to people that attend. So you have to stay on for at least 55 of the 60 minutes in order to get credit. And there we will be sending out certificates to those people who stay on. A couple of times we've had people have to get bumped off and then sign on using a telephone. If you do that, and we don't have your telephone number, and we don't know we have your telephone number, please email me and let me know that you were bumped off but signed back on using a different ID, and we can give you credit that way. For everyone, if you have questions, my email is lori.nelson at law.utah.edu. Um, I think that is most of my housekeeping. We're going to do this in three parts. First, we're going to hear from Mike O'Brien, who was my old law partner at Jones Waldo. And it's because he's still there and I'm the one that's gone now. But also Mike is the author of Monastery Mornings, a wonderful new book, book about the Huntsville Monastery and growing up with the saints and the monks. Also, we have joining us, Kate Saddlemeyer with the um, Summit Land Conservancy. She's counsel there as well as the conservancy director. Is that right, Kate? Conservation director and legal counsel, yes. And Marlon Jensen, who is a, was an active Utah Bar member and is an emeritus general authority. Marlon, right? Who was the driving force behind the fundraising for the preservation of the Huntsville Monastery land. Mike is going to kick it off for us. And then again, please... If you have questions, put them in the Q&A and I will, we will answer those at the end of the time. Thanks. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Marta. And thanks, Kate. So you're probably wondering what's an employment lawyer and a media lawyer like me doing on a panel uh, talking about the legal ins and outs about uh, conservation easements. Well, as Lori mentioned, I, I have a personal connection to the monastery. Uh, know nothing about conservation easements. That's why I'm grateful that Kate's here and that Marlon's here. <clears throat> but <clears throat> growing up uh, in the 1970s, my parents got divorced. It was a difficult divorce. And my mom took us up to the monastery in Huntsville, hoping, I, I think, that I would uh, meet someone who uh, would be a good influence uh, over me, despite the uh, problems of the divorce. And I sort of grew up uh, from age 11 at, at the monastery in Huntsville. Uh, so it, it's a very special place uh, for me, and uh, I'm going to take the next 10 minutes or so to sort of tell you the backstory of the monastery, uh, which I think will be an interesting uh, uh, segue into uh, the notion of uh, uh, why it's such a wonderful and special place for a conservation easement. So um, the monks arrived, you may know, uh, in Utah in 1947, July 10th, 1947. They belong to an order uh, founded in Europe called the Order of Cistercians of the Strict Observance. Uh, so they were commonly known as Cistercians or because they had a famous monastery in La Trappe, France, they were also known as Trappist monks. Uh, and uh, they came from Kentucky. There was a, a branch of their monastery, their order in Kentucky. And in 1947, in the uh, post-war years, as the monasteries filled up with men who were disenchanted uh, after uh, World War II, uh, the, the Kentucky monks had to start new foundations because they were, they were overflowing with monks. And so they started one of them in Utah. And the monks arrived at the Ogden Union Station train station on July 10th, 1947. You can see in the, the left-hand corner of the 
screen uh, uh, a screenshot from the Ogden Standard Examiner as to when they arrived. Um, the uh, shots on the screen also show them in their Pullman cars. They had two Pullman cars that they they used to transport uh, themselves and their their meager possessions to Utah. Uh, when they arrived, they lived in barracks that had been used by uh, Italian and German prisoners of war here in in uh, Weber County. Um, there's a picture of those on the uh, uh, the far right side, and they immediately got to work uh, trying to turn uh, ranch land into farmland. In the upper right-hand corner of the screen, you can see a man many of you may recognize as Thomas Merton, a fairly famous uh, Kentucky monk and writer um, who I think wanted to come to Utah but wasn't given the opportunity. But he wrote a lot about the Utah monks and their arrival here in Utah. And one of the, his best descriptions is of the land that the monks arrived at. So I want to read that to you. It's from a 1947 uh, article in Commonweal Magazine. And Merton wrote, the monks have settled a wild and lonely spot. To the east of them is nothing but a wilderness without roads or farms. It is a paradise for hunters who in the past made the monks ranch their base and worked eastward from there. Deer come down to drink at one of the two plentiful springs on the Trappist Ranch. And about the only sound you hear in the valley is the howling of coyotes on the mountainside. At least that was the only sound you heard until the Cistercians set up their bell and began to ring it. And of course that bell started to ring in 1948 and it rang for some 70 years throughout the valley as the monks went about uh, doing uh, the things that monks do. And what is that? Well, uh, some early photos you can see they were again uh, living in rather rugged conditions in the barracks. Um, uh, they were devoted to their religion and you see signs of that in the early photos. Uh, they were working to develop a farm uh, and they were working to make what were again prisoner of war quarters into more uh, a more habitable place to live. The land as Merton wrote about was beautiful, simply beautiful and many of you have been up to that uh, land uh, just to the south uh, southeast of Huntsville. The Ogden Valley in and of itself is is absolutely wonderful. Uh, the monastery land is is especially pristine. Uh, and you can see uh, from some of these uh, overhead shots, uh, the Quonset Hut Monastery that the monks built that was supposed to be temporary quarters, but lasted for 70 years. The goal was shortly after they arrived to build a grander uh, stone monastery, more in line with the European monasteries. And you can see an architectural drawing of that in the upper left-hand corner. But for reasons of money and uh, other circumstances, that, that uh, edifice was never built and the monks for 70 years carved out a life uh, on the Quonset huts um, uh, in the rolling hills of the Ogden Valley. Uh, truly gorgeous land that uh, Kate will talk about in more detail, uh, which is the land of course being conserved now by a conservation easement. Um, the monks uh, had a, a Latin phrase that described their life. They called it ora et labora, uh, prayer and work. And here's some photos from the monk archives of, of the monks at work. You can see there's a variety of things they did. Some of you perhaps tasted their bread or their eggs, and there's photos of, of that there. Uh, they were very much connected to the land and to the animals uh, who were on the land naturally, as well as to the farm animals that they brought uh, with them. And so you see Father Patrick in the upper left-hand corner uh, with a baby calf. You see Brother Norbert uh, in one of my favorite photos from the archives of the monastery in the, in the lower left-hand corner with a, a bunch of uh, uh, piglets, probably just born a few hours ago. Uh, you see another monk feeding a porcupine. Uh, and you see the monks decorating the hallways of their cloister with flowers, which is something they would do as part of their religious observations. More photos of the monks at work. Uh, they made honey, uh, famous uh, uh, creamed honey that again, maybe you had the chance to taste. And you see Father Bartholomew in the lower right-hand corner uh, processing the honey. Uh, of course, they took care of their own uh, facility. So you see John, the laundry monk. You see Father Thomas doing scholarly work in the upper uh, left-hand corner. You see some work on the new monastery bell that arrived uh, sometime in the 1980s. And then you see in the upper right-hand corner, Brother Nicholas, who was the rancher and the cattleman, who in his later years uh, 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 changed his work into building clocks uh, that were sold in the monastery bookstore. Uh, 
So aura et labora, right? The monks didn't just work. They also were at prayer. And they were at prayer wherever they were. So you see this lovely photo of a monk in the fields, um, in his robes, uh, uh, you know, praying as, as the sprinkler system is, is, is going. Maybe he's praying for uh, enough water to, to water the fields, right? That's an issue in Huntsville this year. Um, you see the lovely church the monks built, the Quonset hut, the beautiful stained glass window uh, that was there at the front has been preserved and is now in a church in South Ogden. Um, and you see the monastery uh, uh, chapel at night. Again, one of the most stunning, uh, wonderful places uh, uh, on the entire ground. Um, it was a brotherhood, right? They, they prayed together, they worked together, um, but they grew very close as brothers. And some of the most compelling photos representing that brotherhood, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you see Brother Felix, uh, commonly known throughout the valley uh, as the monk who was uh, the outside representative to the valley. And he's there comforting his, his aging and, and, and dying brother, Father Jerome, um, in his last, uh, last few days. Uh, you see the monks uh, in their very simple burial process in the lower left-hand corner, right? The monks would be buried in their robes right in the ground. And that cemetery uh, is still part of the land that's uh, being conserved in Huntsville. Uh, you see the brotherhood as they work together, right? A, a friend of mine in the lower right-hand corner, Brother Boniface, uh, in his very, very younger days, one of the founders of the monastery, uh, baking the monastery bread. And then, of course, a lovely photo of the monks on the upper right-hand side, uh, the monks I knew in the late 1970s and the 1980s, the, the entire group. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, you know, I was part of that life uh, in a very uh, indirect way. Um, my family in the midst of the divorce, as I mentioned, went up there. The monks were very kind to an 11 year old kid who was hanging around. They let me pretend like I was working on the farm with them. I don't think I added much to the efficiency of the place, but nonetheless, they, they, they let me hang around, taught me many, many valuable life lessons. I could talk for hours and hours about that, of course, but as Lori mentioned, I've, I've written a book about it and you can see the cover of that book on the left-hand side of the, uh, of the page. One of the most wonderful things that happened at, in Huntsville was that Mother Teresa of Calcutta visited there in 1972. Uh, she was uh, canonized as a Catholic saint uh, a few years ago. Um, and uh, uh, you know there are many uh, Latter-day Saints in the Valley, many wonderful Latter-day Saints in the Valley, uh, but Mother Teresa is the first official Catholic saint to have visited the place. She wasn't a saint then, of course, it took a few years afterwards, um, but uh, uh, she eventually made it. Uh, and then you see a picture in the uh, upper right-hand corner of me as an older man with Father Patrick. And right next to that, just above it, <clears throat> you see a picture of the very precocious 11-year-old me with Brother Boniface and my mother. We're still friends today, thankfully. I've been able to maintain a relationship with the monks over all these years. And so you see some more recent photos. Uh, you see the rededication of the statue that stands over the monastery cemetery uh, in the upper right hand side <clears throat> in the uh, excuse me the upper left hand side in the upper right hand side you see one of the restored barns that the owner of the land now Bill White uh, had uh, on it painted a monk in fact the monk who's holding the piglets that you saw in the earlier photo in the middle you see a wonderful photo of Bill White the current landowner and Father Patrick from just this last March blessing the fields hoping for a good harvest. And then just some family shots I snuck in there. Uh, I, I've been able fortunately to have each one of my kids and my wife meet a monk. And there's some photos of us at the monastery and us with some of the current monks, five whom survive and live at St. Joseph's Villa uh, here in Salt Lake City. Uh, after 70 years, of course, there weren't a lot of new monks joining the monastery. So the end uh, of the monastery came and as it approached uh, in 2017, uh, the Huntsville neighbors made the monks the grand marshal of their annual July 4th parade. And there's a lovely photo of three of the monks uh, with a descendant of David O. McKay, by the way, uh, driving the buggy in that lovely photo. Uh, and then you just in a couple of parting shots, you see uh, some of the, uh, the, the photos of the land today. Um, the monks wanted their land to be preserved for agricultural purposes in an open space if possible. And I think that desire comes again from Thomas Merton. And I'd like to close with a quote from him. Uh, in the 1960s, he, he engaged in a letter writing uh, 
with uh, Rachel Carson, of course, an early environmentalist who wrote the book Silent Spring. Um, and he wrote in his journal that people might question why he was doing that. And, and they said, someone might will say, you worry about birds. Why not worry about people? And Merton's response was, well, I worry about both birds and people. And in, to Rachel Carson, he wrote in 1967, if the monk is a man whose life is built upon a deeply religious appreciation of his call to wilderness and paradise, and thereby to a special kind of kinship with God's creatures in the new creation, then we might suggest that the monk of all people should be concerned with staying in the wilderness and keeping it a true wilderness and paradise. The monk should be anxious to preserve the wilderness in order to share it with those who need to come out from the cities and remember what it is like to be under the trees and to climb the mountains. The monks very much took those words of Merton to heart uh, and they were smart enough along with current landowners, Bill White and uh, Winston Wangsgard to get folks like Marlon Jensen and uh, Kate Saddlemeyer from the Summit Land Conservancy involved in preserving the land uh, after the monks had to leave it. And so I'd like to now stop sharing my screen and turn my time over to Kate, who's gonna talk to us about uh, uh, conservation easements in general and the story uh, in a little more legal detail of how the monastery uh, is being put under a conservation easement. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks, thanks for your stories. Thanks for telling us just how unique this property is. Um, I'm very um, honored to be part of this project. I work as in-house counsel for the Summit Land Conservancy. This is a little bit about us. Um, we're based here in Park City. Um, we've just started to go more regional and move out of Summit County. We're able to do that through our partnership with Ogden Valley Land Trust. Um, and we'll hear more from Marlon later. We started in um, 2002. We have 46 easements. I'm kind of, I'm proud of some of these numbers, some of the money that we've paid to landowners. <laughs> and um, I just, for this transaction, we do a variety of transactions, but the one that we're talking about in this case is what we call an ALE, um, funded by the NRCS, which also has a bargain sale component. The bargain sale means that the landowner donates. Thank you very much, landowner. Thank you, Bill White. Thank you, Winston. Um, so we have, because we have a landowner component there. Um, we have an IRS component. Okay, I'll just, this is what we're gonna, what I think we'll talk about today. Um, I just like to talk about what goes into a conservation easements, easement, the laws and regulations that apply. We've kind of got the Utah Conservation Easement Act, um, the Land Trust Alliance, the Section 178, which is the IRS code. And in this circumstance, we've got federal regulations for the federal funding component. Um, after we go through that, I'll take you through just the transaction steps that we do with a typical conservation easement transaction. Um, well, okay, so we'll just start with the basics of a conservation easement. It's a perpetual agreement. That's a really, really long time. When you're drafting something for forever, um, <laughs> it's hard work. You need, a, you need to see into the future. Um, we have a willing landowner, of course. It's a recorded legal document. It creates a property interest, but it's also an agreement between the landowner and the conservation easement holder. A conservation easement holder, it can be a government, agency, county, municipality, um, but typically it's what we are. We are a non-profit and we're what you call an accredited land trust. Um, I'd just like to talk about the Land Trust Alliance here for a minute. Um, they're, they really guide the conservation easement work that we do. So they help us with, okay, what actually goes into a conservation easement and also with some of the somewhat unusual obligations that happen with a conservation easement. Um, in a little bit, I'll talk about how when we do an easement, we do a baseline, which becomes 
usually a really thick document. We're talking 300 pages that we do. You know, they're big. They're a lot of paper, like save the world, kill a tree. That's what we do. Um, but it kind of, the Land Trust Alliance guides how we describe the conservation values and the conservation purpose um, for our easements. It also, we have an obligation to do annual monitoring after we take an easement because, you know, forever is a long time and you need to make sure your conservation values are maintained into perpetuity. So that's just, I just want to make people aware of this resource out there. If you're looking to practice in this field, they're great. They have, you know, everything about conservation easements. Um, what conservation easement does, we're protecting conservation values. Now, what are conservation values? Michael has talked about them <laughs> already. You know, it's these places that are so you know, kind of unique, special. You, you just don't want to see, you just don't want to see them built on. You don't want to see them developed. Um, I think... I think most people kind of know they have this sense of what is the, is the love. What is a conservation value? It can be, can be different components. Um, but when it comes to placing a conservation easement, um, it ends up being the IRS <laughs> who help us shape what goes in a conservation easement. So there's this famous section 170H um, and these criteria. And these criteria are kind of adopted by, you know, other, say, municipalities if they're dedicating open space funds to conservation easements. Um, this is kind of the, the guiding star. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through um, these criteria and how they do and don't apply to this particular monastery property. Um, the first one is we can say land for out public outdoor recreation is a conservation value. Um, in this circumstance with the monastery, we don't have that as a conservation value. And it's it's kind of um, a lot of landowners think, oh my gosh, I'm doing a conservation easement. I have to open it up to public access. And that is just not true. Most of the easements that um, I work on, particularly the agricultural land easements, um, you know, a working, a working farm and public access, those things don't always go together. So, so it's not one of them. Um, the next one here, relatively natural habitat. We see that in most easements. You'll notice here it's relatively natural habitat. So, you know, sometimes there's a notion that, you know, the land that you're protecting has to be completely untouched by people. And that's not the case. I mean, this property, it's like 1,050 acres. It's got um, environmental system benefits. You know, in our easement, in our baseline, we call out the late, the large game, the elk herd comes down, eats the alfalfa that goes to seed. You've got upper range land. We have the Ogden River on the side of the property as well. Um, you know, migratory bird habitat. Um, there's all these, all these ecosystem benefits that we get from these agricultural land easements. This third provision here is perhaps kind of the most uh, complex and, and most difficult to draft. You've got preservation of open space. And then you're starting to talk about scenic enjoyment. Okay, what is scenic enjoyment? We, we all think we know what that is. Um, the IRS regulations go deep into what is scenic. It's kind of, it's somewhere between tortured and poetic to describe, okay, what's scenic to one person? Is that scenic to everybody? But obviously, you know, we have that. Um, they link scenic enjoyment to a government policy, you know, to kind of to back it up. For this particular um, property, we were very lucky. We had the um, Ogden Valley General Plan actually calls out the monastery as being of cultural importance and significant open space. So, you know, the point of all these regulations is to affirm that this conservation easement has a genuine public benefit, that it's in the public interest, that it's not just kind of just for one person in their backyard. You're trying to establish that. that that's kind of the point. Um, this 
this last provision here, which is historically important. Oh my gosh, this property is historically important. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. It was like it was great to to hear about that. Um, you know, very unique. Um, and when I first started with this project, I'm like, great, I get to I get to draft myself a new conservation value. But um, it's certified historic structure. It's it's a very limiting provision with this one. So it didn't apply in that case, but the history is kind of, we put it in number three, you know, because it's just important to the public. It's cultural identity and, and history. So, so that's kind of the, that's what that goes with. Um, I've got my dragon picture here and who's afraid of the IRS. Okay. The IRS regulations, they shape, you know, the, the public benefits, um, but there's all kinds of other, you know, somewhat, somewhat weird, <laughs> it's not really weird, but there's provisions to make sure that a donation is really in perpetuity and a public benefit. So, you know, I'm not, I'm really not going to go into, um, into this too deeply because um, Prof Professor Nancy McLaughlin, who works at the University of Utah, she, this is her, this is her field. Um, she does fabulous CLEs where she, she goes de deep into this. I'm just going to give you the dumbed down approach here. Basically, if you would have an amendment provision in a perpetual agreement, is it really perpetual? Is the property really protected forever? That's what that's about. Um, if you have a standard contractual provision that says, okay, if you ask the land trust if you can do something, a reserved right, and the land trust never gets back to you, you know, can that be a constructive approval? And the tax court has said no, because maybe your property isn't protected in perpetuity. Um, floating building envelopes. Um, it's in some conservation easements, the landowner will reserve the right to build, say, a farmhouse in one particular place that's fine if it's in a particular place if it's kind of floating if you can decide where to put it later the IRS doesn't like that says no and then the other one that kind of gets people is the idea of if the easement is condemned or extinguished who gets the who gets the taking who gets the proceeds and the answer is not the landowner because the landowner made a donation so if they get taking proceeds, um, did they really make a donation? So anyway, just kind of be aware if you're <laughs> looking at a conservation easement, there's some, there's some weird things based on perpetuity and was it a real donation? Um, yeah, my notes, they're super interesting. This is the ALE minimum deed terms. Basically, because this was federally funded, we've got the, the federal act, um, play into the previous conservation values that I put up is, you know, because it's an NRS easement, we talk about soil health and agri agricultural productivity as a conservation value. And basically, I've got to get all these provisions in here and it gets compared, you know, the comp and merge feature, the black line to see that I get them all in there. So it's just, it's, um, it's some work. <laughs> um, I'll just take you, take you a little through, through a transaction. You know, it's a, it's a real estate transaction. I think, um, you know, the first step that we do as an organisation with the Summit Land Conservancy is we, we have a, our own internal board process where we evaluate a potential project um, against our criteria, our criteria are largely based on the IRS provisions, the, the Title 57, Utah Act, the Land Trust Alliance guidance. You know, we'd love to protect everything. We don't have the capacity to protect everything. Love that we could do this transaction. Um, IVLT is, is key in that we were able to have the capacity to, to move away from Park City and, and do this one. Um, I think the main kind of difference with a conservation easement and another real estate transaction is your landowner. It takes an extraordinarily long time and a lot of uncertainty <laughs> to do these transactions. You need um, 
a landowner who really wants to do it, who has who has the love, you know. This is not a way where you, um, this is not like selling your property. You do not financially win <laughs> in that way. Um, so, you know, like we have a purchase agreement, but it's contingent on us getting that federal grant. It's hard to set a closing date because there's too many things that are out of our control. Um, we have some due diligence things, you know, you have the appraisal that you need for this kind of transaction is a conservation easement appraisal. Um, they're very complex. They're kind of expensive because the appraiser has to evaluate the value of the development rights that you are taking away. It's hard to find comparable sales for that. Um, so there's some complexity that, to that. You know, we do, we draft a conservation easement, we draft a baseline report. Um, we're waiting for, um, you know, the NRCS. It's a federal bureaucratic process. It takes some time. I mean, it's important. I, I don't, you know, what they do is important. You need to, you know, make sure that the land, the money that you're you're putting into a property um, is, that everything's good. So, it, you know, it takes some time to go through the due diligence. Um, you know, we have a... We have a closing. Um, this is just um, to kind of just explain. This is just illustrative. This is not not this property at all. But just to kind of go back, I've talked about the IRS a lot. Um, we have you're starting out with you know the fee title, what the property, the value of it before the conservation easement. Your regular show up and buy this property. You have to have an appraisal to show, okay, I'm taking the development rights away. Maybe I'm allowing some other, you know, I'm allowing agricultural use for this property. We want to keep it in agriculture. We want to be able to allow the landowner to change his agriculture, keep it productive. So, you know, that's an assessment of what is the landowner giving up? And then there's, Unfortunately, we can never, you know, pay all of that value for what the landowner is giving up. So there's a significant um, donation. And that's kind of where we're getting into, oh boy, oh boy, it takes a village to sign an 8283, okay? The 8283 is at the end of the transaction when you've closed already, you're, um, you're doing this form. And it looks like it's a very, very simple form, but it's not. <laughs> it's like um, there's a supplemental statement, there's accountants involved, you're filing a baseline document. Um, I'm just, I, just this opportunity to mention that it's, it's a hard form. It looks really easy. <laughs> um, but if, you're, if you're ever working in this field, just, just be aware of that. Um, you know, that's, that's, I hope it's really weird being on Zoom and not being able to see any of you. I hope I hope this was useful. I'd like to send it over to Marlon. I'd just like to take this opportunity to really, uh, well, thank you for listening to me. And thanks also to the people who, who let this work happen for me, which is um, the landowners who choose to, <laughs> to uh, do this and also the people who support our organisations. And... Um, uh, let's hear from Marlon. Thank you. Thanks, Kate and Michael, and good afternoon to all of you. I apologize that I'm not as technologically adept as my associates, so I'll just be speaking sort of heart to heart with all of you today about uh, a valley that I love and have made my home uh, my entire life. Ogden Valley was first uh, visited by white men in the early 1820s when a mountain man named Peter Skeen Ogden came over the hill from Cache Valley. Uh, the valley was known actually as Ogden's Hole for a long time. But today it includes the communities of Huntsville, <clears throat> and, uh, which is an incorporated town, and the unincorporated communities of Eden and Liberty. The valley was once a really bustling agricultural uh, area 
until about the Second World War. Uh, even in my youth, I remember in the Huntsville area alone, uh, about 50 small dairies that were in operation. But with the coming of military installations to the Ogden area, many of the farmers uh, opted for a steadier income and their farm became their second job. The decline of agriculture has continued and there's not a single dairy left in our valley today, sadly, and only two or three ranches or farms that could be deemed uh, economically self-sustaining one of which has been this monastery property that we're talking about. <clears throat> the natural beauty and the recreational amenities of the valley have become its biggest drawing card and economic driver. The valley contains uh, three streams, the south, middle, and north forks of the Ogden River, uh, three ski resorts, uh, Powder Mountain Snow Basin and the Nordic Valley, two reservoirs, Kazi and Pineview, and miles of hiking and biking trails. There's good fishing and an abundance of deer, elk, wild turkey, and other wildlife. There's also lots of clean air when the wildfires are contained. The valley's uh, many attractions have contributed to a steady population increase. In the past 20 years, the total population has gone from about 5,800 to 7,100, a 21% increase. Interestingly, the population of those under age 20 has decreased by 25%, and the population of those over 55 has increased by 40%. So we're an aging population with a declining, actually, school population. The number of housing units in the valley has gone from 2,600 to 5,100 in that 20 year period, a 90% increase. I think the most notable demographic change has been the increase in vacation homes as opposed to full-time residents. The majority of homes now in our valley are owned by absentee owners. Under existing zoning and in Entitlements, the Weber County General Plan for Ogden Valley contemplates 11,500 homes in the next 20 years, a doubling, more than a doubling of the current 5,100, on the way to an eventual build out of 25,000 homes. It took 165 years for the first 5,000 homes to be built, and it will take only the next 20 to add 6,400 more. How uh, traffic, water, sewer, air, and other concerns will be dealt with is something that we're grappling with right now as residents of this valley. There's talk actually of incorporating the entire valley as a way of trying to control our destiny. And an interesting initiative to make the valley into Utah's 30th county was recently kicked off. We are having growing pains uh, for sure. It was the prospect of the condition that I've just described that prompted some visionary Ogden Valley residents about 20 years ago to start the Ogden Valley Land Trust. It's a 501c3 uh, organization and our mission is to preserve, protect and steward wisely steward, open space, watersheds, and natural habitat. Over our 20 year existence, we've acquired conservation easements on about 7,000 acres of Ogden Valley land. In contrast to Kate's organization, the Summit Land Conservancy, which is substantially bigger, we are an all volunteer organization that has never been able to pay landowners for the granting of conservation easements. Thank heavens there have been generous landowners with strong conservation impulses who have donated the value of their easements with only the tax benefits Kate mentioned and the gratitude of Valley residents to show for their efforts in most cases. I'll soon be 80 
And I joined the Ogden Valley uh, Land Trust Board of Trustees about five years ago because I thought that uh, helping preserve parts of the valley as open space would be a significant contribution I could make to future generations while my days on this good earth uh, last. And I've also become motivated to preserve the 800 acre farm on which I live. I'm in the process of doing that now. Some years ago, uh, our land trust identified the monastery property as our highest priority for open space preservation. We could see the monks growing older and their numbers dwindling. We knew the day would come when some disposition of their farm would need to be made. With our limited resources as a land trust and the value of that property, we knew it would take a convergence of favorable forces and a little help from heaven to keep the monastery farm from becoming a 250 to 300 home development project. The land wall water and zoning would have allowed just that. Enter Bill White, whose name has been mentioned, who had moved to our valley a few years earlier and his partner, Winston Wangsgard. They succeeded in acquiring the monastery from the Catholic Church and heaven be thanked, they did not want to develop it. Bill had worked with the Summit Land Conservancy on the preservation of a farm he owned in Morgan County. And as the local land trust, we were invited to work jointly with Summit to help raise the funds to partially compensate Bill and Winston for the granting of an easement. The transaction was really made possible when Bill and Winston agreed to donate a significant portion of that value. And when the Summit Land Conservancy was able to secure a sizable grant from the NRCS. We are in the final stages of our fundraising effort, efforts here in Logan Valley. And I, as I was joking before the program began, uh, having spearheaded the effort to raise funds, I'll be grateful when we're finished and people in the Valley will again make eye contact with me. Something I've been having a hard time achieving in recent weeks. We've been thrilled, however, with the interest and financial support shown by Valley residents. And that comes, I think, because we love the monks and love their farm, always admired the things they were doing. And because the Ogden Valley Res, I think, view the conservation of the land as the preservation of a wonderful period of history in Ogden Valley. As we look forward to the future of the monastery property and the other properties in our valley that are preserved or yet will be, we can't help but think of the value to this and future generations of preserving and protecting open space, the agricultural way of life, wildlife habitat, watersheds, scenic views, dark skies, clean air, and spaces free from the noise and confusion of modern life. Surely these conditions contribute in an essential way to the public good. For this reason, an important part of our work going forward will be to encourage existing programs and to seek new ways for counties and for our state to contribute financially to the retirement of development rights. We must also work with landowners who own preserved properties like the monastery to help them find sustainable ways to keep the land usable, productive and affordable. I am grateful for your interest in this topic today, and I invite all of you to consider engaging in some way in the conservation movement. It is a very worthwhile endeavor. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just add one last point. Um, when the monks arrived almost 75 years ago, their Kentucky abbot arriving upon the land uh, said, this place is near to heaven and our job is to make it more so. And for the next 70 years, the monks just did that. They built a little bit of heaven on earth. And I, for one, am so grateful there are people like Bill and Winston and uh, Kate and Marlon and their groups who are willing to keep that little bit of heaven on earth available for the next generation. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thank you all. So um, Kate, there's a question for you. 
Does the holder of the conservation easement have to be a 501c3 not-for-profit or governmental entity? Alternatively, can a conservation easement be created and held by a private party provided all of the conditions for normal conservation easements are abided by? Uh, the answer is yes, it does have to be a non-profit or a government entity, municipality. Um, you can see the public purpose for that because you need to ensure the strength of the organisation um, moving forward to be able to enforce the <laughs> conservation easement and just, you know, it's kind of broad protection, right? It's to avoid people... Um, putting conservation easements on things in their backyard um, administered by their buddies. So that's, that's fairly, um, that's standard across all the Conservation Easement Enabling Act will have that. And also like for the federal legislation, um, the federal funding requirement, um, there's some sidebars on what kind of entity can hold the conservation easement also. So. Thanks. So uh, what happens to the water rights? Does the conservation easement protect the water rights as well? Um, yes, this one does, certainly. When we take an agricultural land easement like this with irrigated land, where that is a key part of the conservation value, um, we make sure that we encumber water rights in the do document sufficient to keep it in agriculture. So um, in this monastery, absolutely, yes, the water rights are part of the protected property included in the legal description. But that is a separate component of the conservation easement. It's a provision, like it's, um, it's in my um, Exhibit C, where we'll actually mention the water right numbers and that it's tied to the land. Great. Yeah. Um, Marlon, is the... Is the land being farmed now? It is. It's it's actually under a lease to a neighbor farmer, but it's being actively farmed. The range land is being grazed and the irrigated land is raising hay and grain. In fact, Lori, you might be interested to know that the, um, the cattle herd on the land right now uh, uh, is the monk's legacy herd. It was purchased by a neighbor, a fellow named Craig Cross, who's now raising the daughters and granddaughters of the, the monks' uh, cattle. So there's, not only is the land being preserved, but the legacy of the monk uh, cattle herd is being preserved as well. Oh, that's totally cool. So Mike, there's a question for you about the flowers and what liturgical season they would lay the flowers down. I believe that's Easter. Um, uh, so the, to celebrate uh, Easter, they would uh, uh, bring flowers in uh, in various uh, places and uh, decorate uh, uh, the hallways of, of the monastery. So I, I think that's spring, resurrection, flowers, Easter. I think that's the basic liturgical concept. There have, there have been a lot of comments about the honey, and we all remember going to get the honey. But there's a question about whether or not the monks were the first people in Utah to sell 100% whole wheat bread. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I doubt that they were. Uh, uh, but uh, um, Marlon, uh, you're, you're only just a little bit older than me. Maybe you know. <laughs> I don't remember any until the monks, uh, you know, opened up that market, at least here in northern Utah. So certainly they were among the first, if not the first. So Kate, um, does the summit currently only hold one conservation easement? No, no, we hold um, 46 um, throughout. Um, we're mostly in Summit County, but you know, some of our easements are on ridge, la ridge lines with public access and trails. We have 10 right now that are a little more similar to this property, um, kind of agricultural working land, much of it along the Weber River. Um, but we're at 46 and waiting for number 47, which is this one. Should, should be soon. Do you go into agreements for other entities to hold land? For other entities to hold land. Um, or the easement? So, or 
easements. Um, yeah. Sorry, I don't quite understand that question. I'm not getting that question. Yeah. Let me go to this one. Are there any plans for public asset access to the monastery and the cemetery? Um, you know, at at this point, it's it's uh, it's not a part of our agreement right now. What we have the cemetery site and the the buildings in the middle there of the monastery, um, they're not. They're waiting to figure out. They're not as waiting to figure out what we do with it. Okay, the goal is to improve those buildings and find um, find a great purpose that will allow some public access into that site. Um, right now, there's a, some problems with um, you know it's unoccupied, so if it's left open, you've had some problems with vandalism and, and things like that. So we're, we're waiting to figure out what happens inside that site, where the site where the cemetery is. In fact, unfortunately, the iconic uh, sign at the beginning of the monastery land that said monastery one half mile, it's on the cover of my book. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was stolen. Uh, uh. So, so with the monks, you see the, the better angels of our nature. And unfortunately, with that land when it's been left open and unattended you see some of the worst angels of our nature and so the owners have had to protect both the the tenant farmer as well as some of the historical importance of the land uh after that sign was stolen what happened to the the apiary are they still producing honey yes they, they have a, a beekeeper on the monks aren't obviously but they have a beekeeper uh who has uh, hives on the land who's uh, you know, uh, developing honey, uh, producing honey from the bees that uh, are on the monk property. They make a vinegar, a honey wine vinegar. It's really good. Well, oh, I have some of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there was also a comment earlier that they should make ale or mead, make honey. <laughs> you no, know, they, uh, there's a, a Trappist monastery in Massachusetts, Spencer, that, uh, that makes Trappist beer. And of course, I've been known from time to time to go to the liquor store and acquire some Trappist beer. And uh, I'm not going to confirm the rumors that I bring that down to the monks. I'll let you you all decide that for yourselves. But uh, it'd be it'd be wonderful uh, if that could be made there as well. And I also want to tell you, Mike, um, that we have one of our attendees. Her uncle was Leander Dosh, who was oh, yeah. a, a monk. Yeah. And yeah, she's Father, Father Leander, he was one of the abbots. Uh, I just saw him last weekend. Uh, you know, Bill is very good to the monks, and he, he invites them up to the property often for barbecues. And we took the five remaining monks up just last weekend uh, for uh, a barbecue lunch uh, up in Huntsville. Uh, and Father Leander was one of them. Great. So, Kate, do you work with governmental agencies to secure conservation easements? Yes. Yes, the example of this one, we're working with the NRCS. So it's a farm bill program, the um, FDA, NRCS is the agency we're working with um, for this conservation easement. Um, we've done some too around with um, Summit County, um, just closed a transaction um, in Midway with Midway City, which is um, funded through open space bonds like the Wasatch County open space bond and Midway City open space bond. So much of our work is with these, you know, municipal um, lands. So let me, uh, let me ask you this question. Um, one of our listeners was, their family was trying to create a conservation easement, but they didn't mm -hmm. separate out the mineral rights and oh. there's danger about surface disruption. Um, yes. How does the IRS law generally address that potential problem? Yeah, it, it does address the potential problem. Basically, a part of um, this monastery transaction and all transactions that I do is that you have to establish that the possibility of mineral development is so remote as to be negligible unless the surface state and the mineral estate was never se separated. If you own all the way down, then you don't have to meet that criteria. 
and if there's um but if it's if it's been severed um you get a geologist involved we have for this one so it's a geology report just you know and the conclusion around here is okay oil and gas no it's it's not going to happen, you know. It's, it's not economically viable to to extract from there. Therefore, it's okay. But that is it's one of those big IRS regulations. Um, that's that's one of the the things that we have to address um, with so, the federal component also. So. Here's an idea: have the monastery become an Airbnb for reflective retreats, supervised by rotating religious, yeah. you know. Maybe yeah. non-denominational or other religious organizations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be a wonderful idea. Um, you know, the the Marlins alluded to the great friendship between the monks and the saints. Actually, the subject of my next book is I interviewed the neighbors, uh, and there's wonderful stories from that valley, including Marlin's own story. Uh, there's a famous story of uh, uh, Latter Day Saint uh, missionaries about to leave on their mission, spending a weekend at the monastery. Uh, reading the Book of Mormon as they walk down Abbey Road. Um, <laughs> so it, it's, it's always been a model of, of, of love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, and uh, I, I think that would be a wonderful possibility. Marlon, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you agree with that. Totally. I was asked once in an interview if I had ever experienced holy envy. And what came to mind was my feelings about the monastery and the monks their way of farming, their way of life. It was always something I think that the saints in this valley envied. So Kate, um, here's a comment. Private land can be encumbered by terms of a typical conservation easement provided the owner does not take any tax credits. Uh, a typical conservation easement. I, I don't know what a typical <laughs> conservation easement is, but, um, but if you're, Speaking of, um, yeah, I mean, I do conservation easements where there is absolutely no IRS deduction as well. If that's what you're asking, um, that can happen. I still, when we do a conservation easement, though, we're still kind of guided by our Land Trust Alliance standards and practices and the notion of what's the right thing to do. These IRS ideas, um, goals will absolutely still play into um, what's within the conservation easement document. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but. So um, Mike, there's a comment that said, um, they're going retreats to the monastery from the sixties through the nineties and um, got to know many of the monks, was told the vast majority of the monks came directly out of World War II. As a result, they were a rather homogenous group, which made it feel insular and made other younger men who wanted to join the monastery feel like they couldn't break into that homogeneity. Do you have any comment about that? Um, it, 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 there, a lot of them had the, the uh, war experience, not just from World War I, but uh, World War II, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, uh, 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 so there was a variety of, of those experiences. Um, it, it was a fairly diverse group, actually. The first uh, man who joined was a, a Hispanic male from California, who, of course, had fought in the war, um, uh, but came from a very different place. Uh, you know, I, I think we could spend another hour or two talking about why people don't join monasteries today. It's a common pattern across many monasteries, not just mm -hmm. Huntsville. Um, uh, but I think there's a renewed interest at the same time in, in the monastic values. And one thing that I've had to do as, you know, a non-monk is I, I took the five vows that the monks take and translated them into my own life. So, for example, I don't take a vow of poverty, but I can live a more simple life, right? I'm not a celibate, but I can live in my life with devotion, right? So th there's a lot of, of, of wonderful lessons that apply across many demographics from these men and these monks, um, and uh, I, I think the story of, you know, the decline of monasteries is more complex than that uh, uh, and somewhat regrettable. And, you know, that's why many of us are trying to keep alive the, the, their story. So people years from now will, will know uh, who these men were and what they did. Great. Well, you know, 
thank you all for the work that you've done on this. I, we were talking earlier, I would like to just take a blanket conservation easement and put it over Teton Valley where I'm from. So none of that land can be ruined. So I fully appreciate what it is you're doing. And I, and I also understand the really hard work that goes into getting this just right to protect the land and, and, and preserve the memory and the, and the values that, that surround that land and what comes from it. So thank you very, very much, all of you for your work on this. And thank you for agreeing to participate on this panel. I really appreciate it. And I hope all of you that were listening um, get a feeling for what this means, what it means to be able to do a conservation, conservation easement, what it means to be able to contribute to that, to be part of it, and how wonderful this is for, for lawyers to have this ability. So thank you all for joining us and thank you very, very much to our presenters. Thank you.